Book 3, Chapters 12 and 13 of The Antiquities of the Jews, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Bursow. The Antiquities of the Jews, Volume 1, by Flavius Josephus. Translated by William Whiston. Book 3, Chapters 12 and 13. Chapter 12, Several Laws. As for adultery, Moses forbade it entirely, as esteeming it a happy thing that men should be wise in the affairs of wedlock, and that it was profitable both to cities and families that children should be known to be genuine. He also abhorred men's lying with their mothers as one of their greatest crimes, and the like for lying with the father's wife and with aunts and sisters and sons' wives, as all instances of abominable wickedness. He also forbade a man to lie with his wife when she was defiled by her natural purgation, and not to come near brute beasts, nor to approve of the lying with a male, which was to hunt after unlawful pleasures on account of beauty. To those who were guilty of such insolent behavior he ordained death for their punishment. As for the priests, he prescribed to them a double degree of purity, for he restrained them in the instances above, and moreover forbade them to marry harlots. He also forbade them to marry a slave or a captive, and such as got their living by cheating trades and by keeping inns, as also a woman parted from her husband on any account whatsoever. Now he did not think it proper for the high priest to marry even the widow of one that was dead, though he allowed that to the priests, but he permitted him only to marry a virgin, and to retain her. Whence it is that the high priest is not to come near to one that is dead, although the rest are not prohibited from coming near to their brethren or parents or children when they are dead, but they are to be unblemished in all respects. He ordered that the priest who had any blemish should have his portion indeed among the priests, but he forbade him to ascend the altar or to enter into the holy house. He also enjoined them not only to observe purity in their sacred ministrations, but in their daily conversation, that it might be unblameable also. And on this account it is that those who wear the sacerdotal garments are without spot, and eminent for their purity and sobriety. Nor are they permitted to drink wine, so long as they wear those garments. Moreover, they offer sacrifices that are entire, and have no defect whatsoever. And truly Moses gave them all these precepts, being such as were observed during his own lifetime. But though he lived now in the wilderness, yet did he make provision how they might observe the same laws when they should have taken the land of Canaan. He gave them rest to the land from plowing and planting every seventh year, as he had prescribed to them to rest from working every seventh day, and ordered that then what grew of its own accord out of the earth should in common belong to all that pleased to use it, making no distinction in that respect between their own countrymen and foreigners. And he ordained that they should do the same after seven times seven years, which in all are fifty years. And that fiftieth year is called by the Hebrews the Jubilee, wherein debtors are freed from their debts, and slaves are set at liberty. Which slaves became such, though they were of the same stock, by transgressing some of those laws, the punishment of which was not capital, but they were punished by this method of slavery. This year also restores the land to its former possessors in the manner following. When the jubilee has come, which name denotes liberty, he that sold the land and he that bought it meet together and make an estimate on one hand of the fruits gathered, and on the other hand of the expenses laid out upon it. If the fruits gathered come to more than the expenses laid out, he that sold it takes the land again. But if the expenses prove more than the fruits, the present possessor receives of the former owner the difference that was lacking, and leaves the land to him. And if the fruits received and the expenses laid out 
prove equal to one another, the present possessor relinquishes it to the former owners. Moses would have the same law obtain as to those houses also which were sold in villages, but he made a different law for such as were sold in a city. For if he that sold it tendered the purchaser his money again within a year, he was forced to restore it. But in case a whole year had intervened, the purchaser was to enjoy what he had bought. This was the constitution of the laws which Moses learned of God when the camp lay under Mount Sinai, and this he delivered in writing to the Hebrews. Now when this settlement of laws seemed to be well over, Moses thought fit at length to take a review of the host as thinking it proper to settle the affairs of war. So he charged the heads of the tribes, excepting the tribe of Levi, to take an exact account of the number of those who were able to go to war. For as to the Levites, they were holy and free from all such burdens. Now when the people had been numbered, there were found 600,000 who were able to go to war, from 20 to 50 years of age, besides 3,650. Instead of Levi, Moses took Manasseh, the son of Joseph, among the heads of tribes, and Ephraim instead of Joseph. It was indeed the desire of Jacob himself to Joseph that he would give him his sons to be his own by adoption, as I have before related. When they set up the tabernacle, they received it into the midst of their camp, three of the tribes pitching their tents on each side of it, and roads were cut through the midst of these tents. It was like a well-appointed market, and everything was there ready for sale and due order. And all sorts of artificers were in the shops, and it resembled nothing so much as a city that sometimes was movable and sometimes fixed. The priests had the first places about the tabernacle. Then the Levites, who, because their whole multitude was reckoned from thirty days old, were twenty-three thousand eight hundred and eighty males. And during the time that the cloud stood over the tabernacle, they thought proper to stay in the same place, as supposing that God there inhabited among them. But when it removed, they journeyed also. Moreover, Moses was the inventor of the form of their trumpet, which was made of silver. Its description is this. In length, it was little less than a cubit. It was composed of a narrow tube, somewhat thicker than a flute, but with so much breadth as was sufficient for admission of the breath of a man's mouth. It ended in the form of a bell, like common trumpets. Its sound was called in the Hebrew language a sosra. Two of these being made, one of them was sounded when they required the multitude to come together to congregations. When the first of them gave a signal, the heads of the tribes were to assemble and consult about the affairs to them properly belonging. But when they gave the signal by both of them, they called the multitude together. Whenever the tabernacle was removed, it was done in this solemn order. At the first alarm of the trumpet, those whose tents were on the east quarter prepared to remove. When the second signal was given, those who were on the south quarter did the like. In the next place, the tabernacle was taken into pieces and was carried in the midst of six tribes that went before, and of six that followed, all of the Levites assisting about the tabernacle. When the third signal was given, that part which had their tents towards the west put themselves in motion, and at the fourth signal those on the north did so likewise. They also made use of these trumpets in their sacred ministrations, when they were bringing their sacrifices to the altar as well as on the Sabbath, as on the rest of the festival days. And now it was that Moses offered that sacrifice, which was called the Passover in the wilderness, as the first he had offered after the departure out of Egypt. Chapter 13. Moses removed from Mount Sinai and conducted the people to the borders of the Canaanites. A little while afterwards he rose up and went from Mount Sinai, and having passed through several mansions, of which we will speak, he came to a place called Hazaroth, where the multitude began again to be mutinous, and to Moses for the misfortunes they had suffered their travels, and that when he had persuaded them to leave a good land, 
they at once had lost their land. And instead of that happy state in which he had found them, they were now still wandering in their miserable condition, being already in need of water. And if the manna should happen to fail, they must then utterly perish. Yet while they spoke many and bitter things against Moses, there was one of them who exhorted them to be unmindful of Moses, and of what great pains he had been at about their common safety, not to despair of assistance from God. The multitude thereupon became still more unruly and mutinous against Moses than before. Hereupon Moses, although he was so basely abused by them, encouraged them in their despairing condition, and promised that he would procure them a quantity of flesh meat, and that not only for a few days only, but for many days. This they were not ready to believe. And when one of them asked from where he could obtain such a vast plenty of what Moses had promised, Moses replied, Neither God nor I, who hear such shameful language, will leave off our labors for you, and this soon shall appear also. As soon as ever he had said this, the whole camp was filled with quails. They stood round about them and gathered great numbers. However, it was not long before God punished the Hebrews for their insolence, for making those reproaches they had used towards him, and no small number of them died. And still to this day the place retains the memory of this destruction, and is named Kibrothatava, which is Graves of Lust. End of Book 3, Chapters 12 and 13 Recording by David Berceau, davidbercot.com